Hello there everybody, Sam Strains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. Up to date I have a brand new steam locomotive to unbox for you. <laughs> Well, sort of, anyway, because this model, technically speaking, has been produced before, but not by EFE Rail. So, the loco is this. It is the EFE Rail BT Well Tank, and this has an RRP of £139.95, and I bought mine from Derails Models for £118.95, which is more or less the going rate, and I will include a link below if you want to check those out. Obviously then, this is rather expensive, particularly compared with the, let's say, the Great Western Mogul, which was my last review. I mean, £17 pounds less than that, and that one was really, really good. However, I think this could justify that price if it met certain criteria. For instance, these were powerful locos in real life, so if this model is largely die-cast, like the cheaper Hornby Peckets were, then yeah, I could perhaps get behind it, or perhaps it's got a really top-notch mechanism that allows it to run really, really well. Maybe it's super detailed with lots of beautiful features like firebox flickers, that kind of thing. Yeah, if this model ticks a lot of those boxes, then I could probably get behind that price. Um, whether or not that's realistic or not, we will have to find out. But hopefully, inside this reasonably dull packaging, there will be a very beautiful locomotive. So we're going to get this unboxed. Let's see what this is like, and fingers crossed it will be a good one. All right, here we go. Yeah, it's a pity about the packaging, isn't it, really? Because if you really want a model to sell well, the packaging, the box, has really got to grab you as you walk through the train fair or the model shop. Although I suppose the sad truth is that this year most of those places are shut and you'll be most likely buying this online. So, yeah, I guess it doesn't much matter. So what? It's just a box anyway. Let me show you the end of the box because you can see that this is E85012. It's a BT well tank. And the one I went for is this, 3298 Southern Green Preserved. Yes, this is the preserved example and it also accepts a six pin DCC decoder if that's something you wanted to do. I will briefly show you the back of the box because it does give you a bit of information not about the model puzzlingly but about EFE Rail themselves so if you're interested in the brand then do feel free to pause and read that. Essentially though as I understand it this is a Backman brand but it serves to distribute other brands locomotives for instance this is a Kerno model rail center model uh, they've also been distributing Helgen and other brands so yes that's just a little bit of info if you were wondering but I'm more interested in what this model in particular is like so let's unbox it and find out all right so it's got some decent packaging it must be said it doesn't look very nice but it seems to be quality yeah I've got lots of foam to pack it nicely which is good all right what is this then so this the instructions for the EFE rail BT well tank let's take a look at some of this so there's a bit of just welcoming you running in it suggests half an hour at a moderate speed in each direction that's fine it's got a cordless motor inside not a big fan of cordless motors cordless motors don't really play to the strengths of model locomotives in my opinion uh, accessories or oh, we'll have a look at those cleaning and maintenance lubrication it says after every 24 hours of operation it needs to be lubricated on the back there's a bit about decoder fitting as you can see this seems to work a little bit like the dapple mogul i showed recently but we'll see if it's as ingenious as that setup was i don't think they are from what i remember ah inside here we go a bit about body removal so i will be able to remove the body hopefully if i can actually get it off and i can show you the insides and below there you've got a bit of history on the bt well tank so as, as always if you want to pause and read that do feel free to now then let's take a look at what we get in terms of the actual model so we've got an accessory bag here which is sticking out of the top so let's have a look uh, this appears to be largely fireman's tools there could be some other bits there shovels fire irons that's quite a nice inclusion actually they certainly didn't have to do that did they so yeah i wonder if there's a nice place for those to go on the model that should be nice oh and let's not distract from the model itself there it is and i must say even though it's kind of obscured by the packaging the thing looks fantastic, doesn't it? This southern green is absolutely gorgeous. I suppose regardless of the quality of the model, I'm going to like the livery, aren't I? I think that's an inevitability, really. Right, come on then. Okay, and there seems to be yet another detail back here in the top left. Weight, it's hard to gauge it as always, but it doesn't feel dreadfully heavy. I'm still not 100% sure whether this is going to be all plastic or all metal, or probably a hybrid of both, realistically, but we shall see. Right. Take off the sleeve and let's see what we have in detail bag number two. 
All right, so I mean, the white bits look like head code discs, if you ask me. You've got uh, coupling hooks for the buffer beams, vacuum pipes. Uh, you've got the NEM couplings, which are not pre-fitted to the model. Uh, that's fair enough, I suppose. Yeah, it's not too difficult to fit those. Fairly standard detail bag, really. Nothing out of the ordinary there. Go on then, let's have a look at this loco. Let's find out whether this is actually any good or not. Let's see. Right, let's pull this out and see. Whoa, this is not a heavy model. <laughs> This is light as a feather, seriously. Wow. Uh, it looks very detailed, it must be said, but also it feels very, very plasticky. And I can tell straight away the running plate and the boiler, those are all made of plastic, which is very, very puzzling. Like I say, this was a very expensive model. I think in order for this to compete with other models with a similar price tag, this had to have at the very least a die cast running plate. Like I said earlier, these models are supposed to be quite powerful. With this amount of weight or lack thereof, I can't really see that being the case. Although, of course, I'm willing to be surprised on that. Besides that, though, visually, this looks very, very nice. I can tell even at a glance that the decoration is done to a very, very high standard. And the level of detail seems to be at the very least adequate, although we will look closer very shortly and see the extent of that. Right, here's a little bit of history then on the BT well tanks. And then after we've done that, we will take a nice close look. So the BT well tank, or the 0298 class, you can see why they don't refer to it as that, can't you? Originated from the LSWR, which is the London and South Western, in 1863, when the first of 85 examples were built to the design of Joseph BT. So this is one that I was wondering about when I first heard about well tanks. What is a well tank? Well, essentially, this is where the water is stored in a literal well, which is usually between the frames of the locomotive, below the foot plate, hence the unusual look of the locomotive. You'll notice that there are no prominent tanks on the side of the loco as you get with a sort of standard side tank engine. This setup gives good access to the boiler and it also gives the locomotive a low center of gravity, although it does restrict the size of the water tank and therefore restricts the range of the locomotives. This led some examples to be eventually converted into tender engines and that's something I'd love to see in model form. The first batch was built by Bayer Peacock from February 1863 and the design proved to be speedy, powerful and reasonably efficient too. Amazingly, all but three were withdrawn from service before the turn of the 20th century, although incredibly two still managed to be preserved, which is really not bad going, is it? Ha ha ha, welcome folks, come, come in and sit down. Do you like my new silky voice? It's designed to hide the fact that I'm actually triggered and I feel like I've never been ripped off this badly before. Now, for £118, I was expecting a quality scale model and instead I've got this plastic garbage. It really is plastic garbage. Man, I need to calm down. I'm seriously annoyed at this. How can they do this to their paying customers? How can they bite the hand that feeds them so badly? Right, let's talk about the weight then. So this weighs in at 102 grams because the body, the running plate, is all made of plastic and that goes for a lot of the detailing as well although we'll come on to that let's talk about some other locomotives then let's give some context to that remember this locomotive that i paid 18 pounds for smoky joe well that's 22 grams heavier and that even has a die cast running plate 18 pounds it doesn't stop there though we've got the hatton's andrew barclay 040 locomotive much smaller tank engine that's 27 grams heavier and it's also 20 pounds cheaper then you've got the b2 from hornby again a smaller locomotive seven 25 grams heavier and it's available for 99 pounds so that's almost 20 pounds cheaper i mean i'm laughing but it's far from funny is it really i mean look this warwell wagon weighs more than backman's new bt well tank it beggars belief how can they justify such ridiculous prices for such cheap and nasty models? And this isn't cheap and nasty just because some buffoon at the factory doesn't know what they're doing. It's actually been put together reasonably well. It's actually cheap and nasty by design. I mean, look at the safety valves. I, I'm sorry, I didn't realise I'd stumbled into Thomas the Tank Engine. Look at the state of those. You've got the piston assembly down here. That looks like it's all made of plastic. I've got triangle locomotives from the 1950s that cost £7 that look better than that. I just really, really cannot believe it. We've got moulded plastic buffers. Forget any springiness. Forget even them being made of metal. They're just made of cheap plastic and they look it as well. One of the lamp irons on the front is missing in action, or it would be if there'd been any action. What is it, back in five minutes, is it? So many of the details are just part of the moulding. Look at the valve here on the side. And the details that are separately fitted aren't done very well. Look at the smoke box door. That is, just look at the state of that. It looks like it's banged into something. <sighs> Happy April Fool's Day, everybody. The pipework has got all flashing all over it, so that looks terrible. The whistle, 
is plastic and horribly painted. What's, look at all the green paint all over it. It's not even been decorated carefully. And it's also covered in shiny glue, particularly on the back of the cab there. The cab interior is laughable. It's got one gigantic splasher that goes right the way through the cab, which would make it impossible for any crew to be fitted, or in real life, any crew to actually operate the locomotive. Forget having a light up firebox door because there's no firebox door for a light to shine through. Man, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I would get this triggered. Let's have a look more closely then, shall we? Let's start with some of the positives, and the, the list is short, so don't worry. The decoration is really, really good. It's top-notch, it must be said. Um, we have got this really horrible, ugly seam parting line that goes right across the top. I'm not very keen on that, but the lining itself is actually really, really nicely done. It's very accurate without any issues at all. And that goes with the rest of the decoration. You can see the center splasher here has got the Southern logo printed onto there very nicely. The side of the coal bunker, again, is nicely lined with the running number printed on there as is the back of the coal bunker as well. One detail that is actually made of metal is the handrail around the locomotive itself which is reasonably nicely done but again there are several spots where the glue is very very visible and again you've got these taps on the side of the smoke box which unbelievably are separately fitted. I know 2020 and we've got a couple of separately fitted parts. Who would have believed that? The cab interior is reasonably lacklustre, as I've already said, because of the giant splasher. The actual controls are okay. It looks like we've got a separately fitted regulator there, and some of the gauges have actually been picked out. So the cab detail itself is okay, but it's kind of all just ruined because of that giant splasher, which just looks absolutely ludicrous. The glazing is nicely done, it must be said. Each window is separately glazed, which makes it look a bit more realistic on the inside. Although, why did they bother? Because it's got that huge splasher. That can't have been on the real thing, can it? So the coal load is okay. I mean, it's not too bad. I'm not sure if it's removable yet. Um, maybe I'll be able to get it out when I stamp on it. But until then, I'm not too sure. I do like the inclusion of this tool, which is being fitted. I don't know why that tool was fitted and not the rest that came in the detail bag. That's strange, but no, that's fair enough. You've got separately fitted... Oh, look, more separately fitted parts. Look, we've got some lamp irons around the back. And also more plastic buffers. Those buffers look terrible, don't they? Really, really nasty plasticky buffers. What would be wrong with proper sprung buffers? Or at least metal ones. The wheels are okay, but weirdly the axles kind of recess deep into the wheels. So you've got this massive dimple. I've not seen that on the images that I've seen. And look below it. Is that thing supposed to be a crank pin? <laughs> what a terrible mess that is. Well, I'm a bit frightened to do it, but let's remove the smoke box dart and see what the DCC fitting facilities are like. No tool or anything to do this, so you've got to piggle at it with your nails. Oh, right, there we go. Held on by magnets. How wasteful is that? That's probably where some of that massive amount of money went. Any drawer that you can pull out and really easily fit the DCC decoder? No, it's just a mess of wires connected to a circuit board which has been jammed in there, which I'm not even going to try and pull out. So even that hasn't been well designed particularly. It's fussy and those magnets annoy me because they're unnecessary. Ah, <sighs> man. Well, I mean, please let me know if you think I'm being unreasonable. For a beginner's model priced at like 70 quid, I think this would be perfectly adequate. But for 118 pounds, they're having an absolute laugh. And like I say, I feel cheated. This is so light, 102 grams. That is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Shameful. Right, well, I don't have high expectations for the mechanism now, although I will do my best to disassemble this thing and find out how it works. Frankly, at this point, if it isn't clockwork, I'll be impressed. Well, let's do it. So there it is then down onto the track, the appalling BT Well Tank from EFE Rail. We'll talk about the mechanism and in my opinion at least it's not very good. We'll start by removing the body where you can see that somebody's pinched the motor from little Johnny's toy helicopter. Yes, that's a cordless motor and those are used in more model aircrafts because the armatures have very low mass which enables them to accelerate very quickly. Why that's desirable in model trains I will never know. They're also incompatible with feedback controllers. If you run this on a feedback back controller you do risk damaging the motor so really what's the advantage why not just use a standard five pole motor performance is usually the same or better and they're more universally compatible too but as you can see it's a very unsubstantial little motor no flywheel fitted or anything like that it's just connected directly to a rather dirty looking worm drive you can also see how puny the chassis block is. It is actually made of metal, but it does little to contribute to the weight of the model, which as I've mentioned is totally inadequate. And another thing I noticed is that, ooh, the wire management's good, isn't it? I really like that, very, very neat and tidy. 
Removing the base keeper plate reveals the proper set of bearings, which look good until you realise that they do the picking up. So it's effectively a split chassis locomotive. The centre of each axle there is actually made of plastic, and I'm sure that brings back some fond memories for Backman. Uh, yes, they know better than anybody else does the tendency of those to fail over time, so that's great. Uh, interestingly enough, the front pilot truck actually has no bearings whatsoever. Its bearing is a spring. Thankfully though, there are some traditional pickups going to the pilot wheels at the front, so the model does stand a good chance of getting over your points and such without cutting out. Both of the driving axles are driven with gears, which again is undesirable. It's an overcomplicated design which results in higher friction, and it's also unrealistic because the coupling rods are actually just dummies. They don't do anything at all, which is probably why a lot of the running gear is made of plastic. Although it's worth saying that the actual coupling rods are made of metal, so parts of the running gear don't even match each other. Another thing I've noticed is that the wheel surfaces are really quite poor. They've got sort of big bubbles in them, which is strange. I'm not sure now how that's going to affect performance, but that's not what you'd expect on an expensive quality model. Let me see, the gauging again is pretty inconsistent. I measured all three axles and got values 14.5, 14.6 and 14.7 millimetres respectively. According to the 00 Gauge Association, the desirable back-to-back -back should be 14.4 millimetres and on average this was 0.2 millimetres too tight, as was the front-to-back also 0.2 millimetres too tight. The 00 Gauge Association give a margin for error of 0.05 millimetres in either direction and obviously this is way above that. So the mechanism isn't dreadfully impressive and it hasn't redeemed the otherwise very basic yet expensive model as I hoped it would. However, the actual performance may well be half decent. So let us find out. I'm gonna set this forwards and give it its first ever test. Now the instructions did clearly say that running in was required. So I will do that before I draw any firm conclusions, but let's see how this runs straight out of the box, shall we? <laughs> I say with limited expectations. Right, turning it up, let's see. All right, so the crawl did look good. Keep going. All right, I mean, so it was pretty slow. It isn't smooth, it seems to have, seems to be binding up. Or is it just stalling? I can't quite tell. It might be just stalling. Opposite direction. Right, so when it sustains it, the crawl is actually really quite good. That's nice. Look at that. So credit where credit's due, I mean, I'm, I want to be fair in everything I say and do. That crawl is really quite good. Let's see what the speed is like. This is at 50% speed. Yeah, I can get down with that. That is a really nice performer, actually. Let's see how it gets on over the express points. Come with me, let's set it to a little bit faster just to show I'm not being too cruel. Okay, yeah, it did it, that's good. Mm -hmm. What's happening there? It looks like it was wheel slipping. <laughs> Is it struggling with its own weight or was it touching the Hornby track connector? No, I'm not sure. No, it wasn't touching the Hornby track connector. It's strange. It does look like it's wheel slipping at times, doesn't it? Yeah, that's good. That is actually really good. So performance is likely to be the saving grace of this locomotive. Or so I hope. So I hope. Let's get it going around the layout, see how it handles it. Well, to say I'm not a fan of cordless motors and to say I'm not a fan of doing pickups through the axles, I have to admit that this runs reasonably well. I'm going to have to watch carefully and uh, come up with a final conclusion by the time it's finished running in. But generally speaking, this seems to be a really good runner. Thank goodness, quite honestly, thank goodness. And actually, now that I'm seeing it running from a distance, for the first time, it actually looks like a decent model. Up close or when you've got it in your hands, it just feels like the cheap and nasty model that it is really. However, as it runs, I will concede that it looks decent. It looks decent and luckily it performs well. The pulling power remains to be seen. I'm not entirely sure what to expect. Well, I am entirely sure actually what to expect, but I shall not comment until I have tested it. Right, I'll let this run in properly in both directions then, and I'll see you shortly. All right, folks, there we go. That is running in finished, 30 minutes in each direction. And to be honest, as a performer, I really, really like this. 
If it was cheaper or if it was built to a higher standard, I would be highly recommending this based on the performance. Um, yeah, no derailments, no cutting out whatsoever, perfectly smooth, constant speed, no slowing downs around the curves. To be honest, it's a really good advocate for cordless motors. One thing is, it's absolutely useless when it comes to pulling power. I've measured a tractive effort of 0.06 newtons, which at most should allow this to haul eight coaches on straight and level track. That puts it right at the bottom of the ranking of pullers. Uh, it's the same as the LMYR Pug. In real life, this would be more powerful than the Terrier locomotives, except here in model form, it's farcically less powerful than that. And so I've set up just three coaches because honestly, I don't think it could handle any more than that. I think three coaches would have to be the bare minimum for this because like I say, in real life, they're reasonably powerful. The actual performance itself though, seemed absolutely fine. The crawl straight out of the box was marvelous. Is it any better now that it's had chance to run in properly? Yep, yeah, that's marvelous. It's actually reasonably smooth as well. Not 100%. Oh, is it stalled? Or is it just cut out? No, oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. But no, if we're being honest, there we are. That's a slow speed. That is a good crawl. That is a very, very good crawl. It's hard to imagine an engine in real life going any slower than that. So, yeah, I think credit where credit's due. The actual performance is much, much better than expected. There we go. The speed is very competent as well. At 50% speed, it does not race along. The gearing is very, very good. In fact, the gearing might well be its saving grace because it allows for a lot more torque in the mechanism, which is much needed most of the time. Right, come on then. Let's go and couple to the coaches and see if it can manage them. Just three. And these are Backman coaches, by the way, but they've got funny couplings on them. So if it doesn't couple, I don't think it's the Loco's fault. Um, although I think it has. Yes, it has actually. All sorts of. Hang on. There we go. No, it's the coaches that have got silly couplings, not the Loco. Actually, the Loco's couplings work fairly well. They're sprung with just a cheap bit of plastic that sticks out underneath the NEM pocket, but it does seem to work all right, although we'll, we'll check how it behaves on curves. Right, come on then. Let's set it to forwards and see if it can handle three coaches at 50% speed. Here we go. And on the straight here, yes, it can. Right, on the middle line, I have the Hornby B2. And to be honest, if the spec of the BT well tank had have been more similar to this loco from Hornby, I think my ratings would be much, much better. So this loco here is much better detailed, there's no doubt about it. It's largely made of metal, much, much heavier, and also available now for £99. It's also a much better puller, by the way. Yeah, it's hard to take the EFE stuff seriously when they're at the prices that they are. The BT would have made a lovely beginner's model, but of course at that price it just cannot appeal to beginners. That's a serious modeler's price, and yet it cannot be considered a serious model with some of those features. And then on the inside line I have yet another model, which I think is cheaper, yet better, <laughs> than the BT. So this is the Hornby Adams radial tank. This was actually available for the same RRP, it was like 140 odd quid, although now it's down to just £75 on Hornby's website. Again, much larger tank engine, much more detail, and it also has the die-cast boiler. Value for money, Backman, value for money. When will you learn? Honestly, will it be too late by the time you do? I hope not. And there's a surprise. Three coaches, and it's totally dead. Absolutely useless. Three coaches. It's embarrassing. Really, really embarrassing. I feel embarrassed for this little loco. Right, let's back it up. I'm going to go back to 50% speed and we'll actually watch how it performs on the hill with three coaches. Three coaches. It's basics. When you spend £120 on a locomotive, three coaches seems to be a reasonably mild expectation, doesn't it? No. Look, no chance whatsoever. But, you know, perhaps perhaps there's something wrong with these coaches. Maybe maybe the coaches are to blame and not the locomotive. Yes, that, that seems like a reasonable thing to suggest. Well, let me go and grab a more powerful locomotive. And you'll see what I mean by that in a second and see how that gets on. Here it is then, children's toy, Santa's Express. About 100 quid cheaper. Same speed on the controller. Oh. <laughs> How embarrassing. Let's go, let's go even slower. Let's have it crawl, shall we? There we go. Sad state of affairs when cheap train set toys can do a better job. But you know what? I, I might have had a completely different outcome had they not been so greedy with that price. Because come on, not with some of those other models that I've showed existing in the world. 
Have you noticed, by the way, it's actually managed all the way up this hill now? Yeah, it's done the whole thing. Ridiculous. There you go. All right, let's get the BT back on, shall we? I think we'll have to try it with two coaches. So there we go, two coaches. Nice looking model from any sort of distance, but totally inadequate in more than one area. There we go, it's done it. I'm not impressed. What a pity. I was going to say what a waste, but I don't think it was a waste. Because now you guys know exactly what you get for £118. And so even though I'm a £118 poorer, and I've now got this piece of um, <clears throat> model railway memorabilia to store on my expensive shelves, at least I've brought knowledge to you guys. And uh, knowledge is power, I suppose. There goes the Peckett. Notice the three coaches, the four wagons and the brake van there without any problems. I don't know, I'm shocked folks, I thought we'd put this kind of thing behind us with the standard of models this year. So here comes some of my ratings then for the EFE Rail BT Well Tank. Detail then, unfortunately the price set pretty high expectations for this model which were not met by a long chalk. So I've given this 2.5 star on detail. I really like the decoration and some of the moulded detail was really quite nice, lots of rivets, that kind of thing. However, it did look very, very plasticky. Now, sometimes models can be plastic but still look half decent. This one is plasticky to the point where it's detrimental to the realism of the model, particularly around the piston area. It looks really, really bad. Again, you've got plastic buffers which are not sprung or anything like that. The safety valves look really bad. The inside motion, well, there's, there's no inside motion because there's no gap underneath the boiler whatsoever. The cab interior is just ruined because they didn't design it properly and there's this really massive splasher going through the whole thing. It's just silly, yeah. Unfortunately, a few things let the detail down. Performance, though, I'm actually going to give it five star. I really can't fault the performance. It's smooth, it remains at a constant speed around the layout, and light as the loco is, there is actually no problem with the torque of the mechanism. So I've got to give it five star. The crawl was phenomenal, really, really good. The pulling power, though, was absolutely pants, shockingly pants for what this model cost. It couldn't pull the skin off a cup of tea, let alone a rice pudding. Eight coaches, uh, that's attractive effort of 0 0.06 newtons. That's the same as the Hornby LMS Pug. Even their Ruston is stronger. And if we talk about the real thing, the real thing in real life uh, had attractive effort of 49 kilonewtons. Uh, and if we compare that to a similar model, say the Terrier, that had 39 kilonewtons of attractive effort. So in real life, this model would be 25% stronger than the Terrier when here it is in model form and it's 83% weaker. It's just ridiculous. And that's because the model is far too light. They couldn't even spend the money to create a die-cast boiler or perhaps a die-cast running plate. Why not? Why not? The mechanism, I've given it three star. Maybe that seems a little bit generous. Perhaps I should explain myself. I've only knocked two stars off. First of all, I don't like the sort of split chassis design. The plastic spaces between the wheels is just not a good idea in my opinion. I've seen far too many of them fail. And also they're a nightmare to maintain. Proper pickups that you can take out very easily and clean are much, much better in my book. However, I, I would start criticising the choice of motor and the method of picking up, uh, and I don't like them particularly, but this model does actually work very, very well, so I think it would be unfair of me to knock the mechanism right down to one star or something like that. However, it must be said, I do prefer to see a nice chunky flywheel. It makes a loco nicer to control, etc. Like I say, though, I don't have any complaints on the actual performance, so I'm going to limit my criticism of the mechanism. The quality, though, I must say, leaves quite a lot to be desired, particularly a model of this price. It's not been assembled particularly nicely. There's quite a few glue marks on some of the various details, even though there's not very many details. And the lack of metalwork really is a shame, not just on the sort of running plate and the boiler, but also in the details as well, as I've mentioned. There's no reason for them to be cutting costs to this extent when the model costs £118 or even less with an ROP of £139.95. It's just not cricket, is it? Right, that leads us nicely on to value for money. RRP, £139.95. Absolutely ridiculous, insulting to our intelligence, and quite frankly, it's insensitive towards the customers that keep Backman in business. 
£118.95 is not much better, it must be said. I showed you earlier on in the review all of the other models that you can buy for the same or less money, which either have a much higher level of detail, an awful lot more die cast, a much better mechanism, or in most cases, all three at once. There's no reason why this should have been so expensive, unless the features of the model were made to match, and hopefully this review demonstrates that that is not the case. Overall then, that's a very lacklustre score of 5.63 out of 10. Let's put that into the ranking. There it is, 57th, just above the hull and below the Hornby 52XX. Yeah, overall, not very impressed. I wouldn't recommend spending £118 on these. I would leave off until they come down in price, and then when they're much below £100, then I might be able to recommend them, because they are good runners. Yeah, I'm really, really disappointed in that, and it looked so nice too. Although obviously that is a crucial part of the scheme, because if it doesn't look nice on the internet, then people wouldn't be induced to buy it. No, it wasn't until I lifted it out of the box that I realised what was going on here. Plastic. How do they, why did they think that was okay? Why did they think that? I don't know. Anyway, folks, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you, en well, I don't know if you enjoyed it or not, but hopefully this was useful to you so that you know what's going on with these and what you're letting yourself in for if you spend 118 of your hard-earned pounds on this, frankly, very subpar model. Uh, mechanically speaking, it didn't look the best, but it did perform well, so that is something that I would definitely cling to if you're a fan of this model. Uh, it's not all bad, it must be said, but at that kind of price, it was nowhere near as good as it needed to be, and that's a pity. And look at that. Even Bullman is too much. Anyway... Hopefully next review will be better. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. I think I'm going to go and cry now. <laughs> Cheers, everybody.